Why Serbia are the dark horses at the 2022 World Cup. We're going to go through that today. We're going to be talking about formation, their back five, their midfield and their two centre forwards. And we're going to be building you a picture of why Serbia are the dark horses for the World Cup. First and foremost, Serbia, how do they line up? Well, they line up with a 3-4-1-2 system that at times does sort of rotate around and look like a 3-4-3. I think one of the most important things of why Serbia are going to be the dark horses uh, this season is that ability to drop into a back five. I think when you look at the European Championships in 2020, we saw a lot of the teams that overachieved at Euro 2020 playing a back five. That enabled them to sit a little bit deeper, soak up the pressure and hit teams on the counter-attack. And for Serbia, that's exactly how they play. With the likes of uh, Zivkovic and Kostic joining the back five and really creating a difficult shape to break down. The DMs drop in, Tadic even moves into a, a midfield position at times. Both strikers get goal side of the opposition and they start to become this really difficult block uh, to get through. They force you down the wings and then they engage with pressure from midfield, with pressure from wing back. And again, if you do get crossed into the box, you've got some really, really good aerial defenders. Mitrovic in the middle, Pavlovic are as a left-sided centre-back, and of course, Velkovic as the right-sided centre-back. Very good in the air. Not only that, but they really shut down the centre of the pitch. It's very difficult to play through the centre of the Serbian block. And if you do play through the centre and they intercept and win it, the counter-attacking potential of those front four players, plus the wing backs is absolutely massive. And that is a big, big reason why I think Serbia are going to be a threat of the World Cup. I think the other thing that only does it, you know, allow for real vast transitional football and counter-attacking potential with having two centre forwards, but also playing with a, a back three gives you options in the box. Not only do Serbia have three pretty decent centre backs in the air, but you're throwing in Vlahovic, who's six foot two, you're throwing in Mitch Mitrovic, the dominated Premier League centre-backs this season, and Milinkovic Savic. You basically have six players all well over six foot, and we know how international tournaments, how important it is to have good set-piece routines, corners, wide free kicks, because getting that first goal is usually pivotal in these tournaments, because then that team can sit a little bit deeper, like Serbia can do in their back five, and then counter-attack their opponent. I think there's a few big things there why I like Serbia. Not only that, you know, Serbia aren't just a counter-attack team they press high up the pitch they're aggressive but they're also very very good at playing out from the back and that's a you know it's a big credit to Serbia and how they've kind of built this team that there are signs or there are similarities between Serbia playing this kind of 3-4-1-2 system and Atalanta under Gasparini what I'm saying there is in terms of the attacking structure will very much move to three uh, players at the back, uh, two midfielders, an attacking midfielder, and then basically a front four where Zivkovic, the right wing back, and Kostic, both left-footed, by the way, you know, a little bit untraditional, but Zivkovic is, is, is looking for those balls on his left foot into the box. But more importantly, that front four really pushes the opposition back and creates space for Tadic in between the lines, but also for Lukic and Milinkovic-Savic to drop between the centre-backs. They operate a little bit like wide centre-backs in possession, the Serbian uh, centre-halves, and they, it creates such a good ball-playing system. At times we see um, Lukic dropping into the, the back three to create a back four to open up even more passing lanes for him in terms of hitting the forwards, in terms of hitting attacking midfield. Serbia are a very, very modern side. Um, and I think that back five shape not only is good for the counter, creates the set-piece threat, but also from a ball-playing perspective, I love how they rotate positions and rotate the ball and progress the play. I think it's going to be massively uh, a shock to some sides of how good this Serbian team is on the ball. Talking about players who are excel on the ball, two of the big stars of this team in midfield, Dusan Tadic at number 10, and of course Milinkovic Savic at the, the midfield position, more of a number eight role. Uh, you'd say Milinkovic Savic performs in the team. Uh, Lukic very much plays that kind of number six, dropping deep, getting on the ball, winning the ball back and so forth. But Milinkovic Savic has, has been fantastic going forward uh, in, of course, uh, Syria for Lazio this season. And when we take a look at his statistics uh, from this year, he's been absolutely sublime. Only Kevin De Bruyne has more assists in Europe's top five leagues this season. From central midfield, he's been directly involved in 10 goals. Uh, we flip that back to last season. 
in Syria, uh, and he was directly involved in a whopping 22 goals from central midfield, more than any other central midfielder in European football. Um, and when you're looking at the combination of assists over the two years, 18 assists since the start of last season, that's only bettered in Syria by Nico Barella. This guy is dominant. Uh, you know, we're looking at performances from this season against Atalanta, absolutely dominant. 110 touches of the football, 79 passes completed, two key passes, seven out of his 10 long balls, one shot, 100% of his dribbles completed, three interceptions. The show's the all-round nature of his game, but what I've loved this season from him is the flair of some of his assists. Some of his assists have been absolutely ridiculous, breaking beyond the forward line and providing like back heels, flicks for Chira Mobley to put the ball home. This is going to be massively important important for Serbia, um, having Milinkovic-Savic in this form that he's in right now. Uh, against Fiorentina, three chances created, two assists. The attacking side of his game is so, so underrated. And flipping that back to the kind of Serbian setup, um, you know, he will join Tadic in this kind of attacking line. Um, and at times you'll see Serbia build up with the back three, have wingers on each side, have two players in each inside channel and two centre forwards. The attacking potential of this team is absolutely disgraceful. You pair Pairing that with a, a Tadic who's been in, you know, basically the form player in for Ajax for the last few seasons, uh, looking at statistics, since the start of the 2021 season, Tadic has been creating 4.4 chances per 90 in the Eredivisie. Another top quality uh, attacking midfielder, false nine, left winger, right winger. Wherever Tadic is, is playing, um, you know, for Ajax, he's always putting the numbers in, always adding that creativity to his to his team, you know, take a recent game against Vitesse, created six chances in the game. We can see the fluidity of that heat map, wide left, wide right, at number ten, and that is the freedom that he gets in this Serbian team. He's basically the, given the free role where he can drift forward, he can drift deep, he can drift left, and he can drift right. Getting a hold of that along with the other threats and elements we've already mentioned in this team. It's going to be difficult, and I think Tadic could really take control of some games. He's registered 62 assists since joining Ajax and Serbia, and he got six assists in uh, qualifying for Qatar, which was the same amount as Bruno Fernandes and Bernardo Silva managed combined in the same group. This Serbian team is definitely one to watch at the World Cup. I think they're really going to cause teams problems. You know, that midfield, as we, we previously spoke about, um, the the defence, the, the back five, which, you know, have been opening up teams, but more importantly, the two centre forwards, two of the best nines in European football for me. I, I absolutely love Mitrovic in the last 12 months, the evolution and the goals that he's scored uh, in the Premier League this season. He has been devastating. A lot of people kind of wrote him off at the start of the season. He couldn't do it, but he scored nine goals in 12 games, averaging 4.7 shots per game. You know, you partner that with Dusan Vlahovic, one of the best bagsmen in European football for me. Yes, he's not, uh, you know, blown Syria away this season, but still scored six goals in 10 games. Juventus have been awful this season. He has been shy of chances uh, in the in Syria, but that kind of is going to change with, of course, Serbia. I think the quality that they've got, not only with Tadic at number 10, we mentioned previously, but the wing backs. You know, one of the big things that we've seen in recent uh, international football has been teams playing back fives like France, but then France playing a centre-back at right wing back and then Phil Amendi at left wing back. You know, you need wing backs that are traditional wing backs. And you'd say that is what Kostic is. Kostic is your quintessential wing back. Gets wide in the final third, crosses the ball into the box with his with his uh, left foot. And on the other side, of course, um, Zivkovic, another left-footed player, he's going to be using a lot of inverted crosses. Is literally going to be feeding Vlahovic and Mitrovic so so much in that kind of final third. If we're looking at the statistics since the start of last season, Mitrovic has scored 66 goals in 69 games for Fulham and Serbia, scoring a goal every 88 minutes in that period with a conversion rate of 21%. That is elite level. Not only that, though, Mitrovic can get Serbia high up the pitch in terms of aerial duels won over the last year, 5.5 per game. He's going to be the target. That's in the top 5% of strikers in European football in terms of aerial duels won. And then we look at, you know, Vlahovic. Again, 
playing some of the best football of his career over the past three seasons in Syria for Juventus and for Fiorentina. He's averaging a conversion rate of 21.6%. He scored 51 goals in 83 games for Juve and for Fiorentina. And you'd argue that, you know, with with um, Vlahovic, it'll be more kind of his form at Fiorentina than his form at Juventus with the Serbian national team. It was absolutely superb playing as their kind of central striker, the way that he'd bring players in, but also finish off moves with a real clinical nature. And I think that's a big reason why I think Serbia are going to be dark horses. That ability to put the ball in the back of the net and having two top quality forwards. And even if there is a, you know, they want to change their system slightly with Serbia, if they, let's say they're playing a, a stronger team and they need to play a little bit more counter-attacking, you know, through throw in Illich in midfield and maybe playing one of the forwards, um, you know, throwing in a defensive midfielder and maybe going a little bit more, 3-5-2, a little bit slightly more defensive, but playing Tadic behind Vlahovic is another great combination of players that I just think the depth of quality that Serbia have got could be something that catches them out. But saying that, they've got, uh, you know, another left wing back, another right wing back that could easily come in and do the job out there. You know, the, the manager for Serbia usually flips them at around 67 minutes anyway. Uh, the one concern I'd say maybe is if they lost both Mitrovic and Vlahovic, but then still they've got uh, Luka Jovic that's got a, you know, big part of his career to prove. He was pretty poor at Real Madrid. He's been pretty poor at Fiorentina so far, but I think there's a time for him. So even if they lose their two big number nines, they've got another guy to come in. Uh, but I do think Serbia, big dark horses in this tournament and the quality that they've got in attack, in midfield, building out from the bat, the wing backs. There's just so much that I like about this side. And that for me is why they are going to be the guys that are going to prove a lot of people wrong. If you actually look at the draw as well, they kind of run through quite an easy line. If they come second in the Brazil group, their run is quite nice to the semifinals. I've drawn them in my World Cup prediction available on the Statman Dave YouTube channel to get to that point and face England, beat Germany beat Uruguay on the way. I love what they're doing so far. But anyway, guys, get into the comments below. Who's your dark horse for the 2022 World Cup? Let's get this party started. Check out SofaScore. We'll see you later.